All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Tom Hildebrand. Uh, I am a solutions architect and engineer at Ubiquity. And I'm here, after I dismiss this, to talk about a uh, high density five, six gigahertz deployment we did earlier this year in Canada. So the project origins started off like any other sort of professional consultation. Uh, Pre-sales engineering team got contacted by one of our bigger customers in Canada. It was an annual corporate conference, they told us at first. And the venue network that was there for the convention site was insufficient. They wanted to stand up and take down a whole network in about a week, which is a little stressful, but perfectly doable. But it's not just any network. See, when I mention corporate conference, you think it's probably just people, you know, updating LinkedIn, posting pictures, whatever. But it's not that kind of end user. We've got people that are programmers, UX designers. This isn't just a corporate conference, this is a hackathon, a 24 hour a day hackathon. With people using data like that, they need not just a network that's reliable, but they need a high capacity network. The good news is we had them pull a report from their MDM and it was about a 50-50 mix of six gigahertz capable clients, M1, M2 MacBooks. So that meant we could start designing with some of our newer APs, some of the six gigahertz capable stuff so that we could try to take advantage of that new spectrum. And I know people have beaten this all week along at this conference, but we were in Canada. We had 1200 megahertz to play with. If you wanted to do a similar deployment in Europe, uh, you could probably make it work with super narrow channels, but I'll get into that design a little later. So this was the location. Uh, some of you Canadians might actually know it, the Entercare Center in Toronto. It's a huge convention space, probably about half a kilometer long. And we were covering both the main Entercare Center and that building sort of to the north of it, that automotive building, they call it. Um, huge amount of people, huge open space. Um, the scale was super daunting at first. Our estimates called for 6,500 people in the main venue and 2,000 in an auxiliary building, 24 hours a day. The design requirement called for 15,000 clients and apparently no lights. But we blew past that 15,000 client estimate. We had 17,000 people on Wi-Fi at peak and 27,000 unique MAC addresses recorded. So this is the location. Um, it's sort of like an airplane hangar more than a convention center. Big steel building, open span, concrete floors, zero RF dividers at all. It looks like there's a little bit of a divider between these areas, but that's just fabric. That's not gonna attenuate anything. So the good news was the venue let us turn off their APs. So we had a completely clear RF environment. They said, hey, just put our, um, put our stuff on, put an SSID up for us and we'll be fine. The bad news was those big open spaces. How do we handle that, even with six gigahertz? How do we design for that? The answer is really simple. We just look at radiation patterns. If you look at an Omni AP, obviously it's gonna radiate in every single direction. And that's what we typically use, throw up in homes, residential uh, environments, throw up in businesses, but we started looking at directional antennas, the things you'd use outdoors. But normally directional antennas, you know, we put them on the side of a building, cover an outdoor plaza, but what if we took that idea and put it on its head? What if we aimed the directional antennas down at the floor? See, we already had these trusses in place from the design that were going to cover some audio, some lighting, um, so we thought we'll just hang some directional APs off of those. That way, if you think of them like a spotlight more than a typical radio, they're gonna cover a small cell. If we anchor those above the desks, above the co-working spaces, then we can guarantee small cell overlap, but still have support for a high density of users. Three, four people sitting on a couch, 10 people at desks, it, it starts to work. So we kept doing that. We put directional antennas also in the hallways, sort of ringing the convention space, and then normal omnidirectional APs 
in these little breakout sort of classroom style uh, event rooms. So when we got onto the surveying, uh, we were brought in as a vendor. Um, there was another company that was brought in as sort of the MSP to do the build out. Uh, the survey was all done with Cydos. So all of our APs were already in Cydos, so there's no customization needed there. But this is what the Cydos project file looked like, and we had 330 APs in there. Now, we designed this with 40 megahertz channels. As you can see, it was pretty clean, but still. 330 access points for a building half a kilometer long, that's still quite a few APs. And so we'll talk about that channel utilization or how we designed the channels. Obviously, 2.4 gigahertz, forget it, in a dense environment, right? 20 megahertz channels, throw it on a few APs where needed and ignore it otherwise. 20 megahertz on five, but on six, well, we don't really, we didn't have guidance for what to do with a high density six gigahertz deployment. So we spec'd for 40, but we ended up going to 80. And 80 gave us a few benefits. Namely, I said that was high performance users that were using that, gigabytes of data. They were able to get really good performance out of that. Uh, speed tests to their servers of about 300 meg, which was good enough for their work. People still elected to plug in, but, um, that was still incredible performance for the amount of clients we had on Wi-Fi. So when you configure an SSID for high density deployment, it's a little different than what you would configure for an office. Um, immediate change that we had to make based on uh, the decision the company made, they originally had a separate five and six gigahertz SSID. And we moved to collapse that as fast as we could. You don't want to have a separate six gigahertz SSID if you have a fleet of modern clients like this. We didn't have to worry about IoT, we didn't have to worry about any sort of legacy connectivity. We could move to WPA3, and we did for security. So in that case, we just did a combined SSID, and that's when we got to see the client separation. We saw a ton of people on five gigahertz before we did that, because nobody wanted to click 6G, they didn't know what that was, they'd never seen it before, but this made everything nice and smooth. Also did proxy ARP, of course. When you're dealing with any sort of stadium environment, large space, you wanna make sure that all those ARPs are contained and not being rebroadcasted. That is the number one thing that will consume airtime, in my experience. Uh, getting into multicast and broadcast control, that is a feature we've renamed it Blocker now. Um, the goal is just to be able to constrain what devices are allowed to send broadcasts. All we had to set it was for the DHCP servers. Set those MAC addresses and we were done that killed multicast across all of the Wi-Fi VLANs. Again, your high minimum data rates on five gigahertz, and your client isolation, and your minimum RSSI. The interference blocker is the important piece. We wanted to make sure that we blocked probe responses. What we found in surveying was that once the APs were up, your iPhone would still try to probe APs on the other side of the building, and since there was zero attenuation in that space, you would have your phone actually getting probe responses from them. So it sort of became a, a sort of DOS for the actual airtime. So being able to set this and make sure that we blocked probe responses was something that I didn't personally have much experience with, but it helped tremendously in this space. The goal really for any sort of deployment like this is just to get the airtime usage per client as low as possible. Again, we were helped a lot by having Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 7 capable clients, but in general, there's a lot of prep work that goes into configuring the SSID beforehand. So we built out our APs, we've got the SSIDs configured, now what? How do we actually get those APs up and running? Well, they're Wi-Fi 7 APs, they need PoE++. How are we gonna provide enough power for that? How do we deal with the cabling requirements for that? We also had to coexist with a lot of latency sensitive multicast traffic that was non-Wi-Fi. There was ACN lighting, Bolero intercoms for staff to communicate with each other. And there was also Dante audio. So we just did racks on racks on racks. Racks behind the scenes, racks on the floor, and then racks going up to the trusses. So we started off with these core racks. I know it looks like a mess, again, five days to put this together. We built that out, that's where the gateways live, DHCP servers, et cetera. 
And then we went out to floor racks like these. So these were positioned at the base of the steel columns basically that held up the roof. We had these every so often with some switching, some UPS there. Um, this one was in the middle of being built out. And then finally we did truss racks. So additional UPS is up there, additional switching capacity, uh, just generally to provide enough power for the APs, for some cameras, for everything else that was needed. And so this is really how we, we did the physical cabling layout for this project. But DHCP and WAN is another challenge. So we're designing for tens of thousands of clients. How do we find a gateway that's big enough to be able to handle all those NAT states? Well, the answer is you don't really do that. So we were lucky in that this has a direct pipe to the Toronto Internet Exchange. And we were able to order three 10 gigabit pipes from three different providers to the Toronto Internet Exchange. But in terms of actually distributing that out, we had nine gateways, three gateways per provider that were each handling different VLANs. The MSP that was working this job with us came up with this ingenious solution of doing random radius assigned VLANs, where a client would join the network, the MAC address would be reported to the radius server, the radius server would then pick a random VLAN to drop it on, and then it would go out one of the random gateways. That way no gateway was overloaded with NAT states, and we had a pretty even distribution across those nine gateways throughout the entire event. We ended up having three aggregation switches, 130 rack switches, and by the end of the event, 880 little eight port edge switches. So I've talked a lot about the physical, physical environment, the physical setup, because that's the world I live in, right? But what I didn't have experience with before this event was actually working and building out a knock. There aren't just set and forget. We can do all of this pre-planning, all of this architecture before the event starts. But you've got to know your staff on site, you've got to know your customer, and you've got to be able to set up escalation pathways, who owns what before the event, how you get in touch with those people, and being able to build out spaces where people can focus on their work, focus on troubleshooting, and spaces where people can actually talk to each other or be able to try to hash out solutions without distracting others. So on day one, we had our people on the ground in the event venue. We had an internal reporting going on Slack, and we had ongoing surveying and verification. This is the most important bit. Just because you've done your survey doesn't mean that you're, you're done. When that event goes live, you need to be walking the floor. You need to be talking to people. You need to be figuring out, is the network I designed actually sufficient? We ended up modifying a lot of APs, whether it was channel, whether it was transmit power, after people got in the space. As we all know, when you're building a stadium, bodies attenuate signal a little bit, so you have to adjust transmit power. Similar sorts of situations here. So this was a really cool uh, screenshot of Wi-Fi Explorer that I took. Um, we had every channel on six lit up on day one, which was super cool to see. I still haven't seen that anywhere else. And so on day two, uh, we did a little bit more. We gave some more edge switching out to users just to give them the choice to plug in. You know, the best wireless user is one not on your wireless at all. And we switched to those 80 megahertz channels because we didn't have that much co-channel interference going at all because of the directional antennas and keeping the cells small. And so this was a Grafana dashboard that we had running at the event just to sort of show off stats this was when the event was just getting going. So we already had 2,400 clients walking in, uh, 17,000 individual Rome events just from people walking in on day two, and we already hit an aggregate bandwidth of a gigabit over the air. And like I said, this was the early morning. People were just sort of walking into the, their spaces, just finding their desks. So are people actually going to exceed that gigabit bandwidth if you, if you have serious work? Yeah. Wi-Fi 7 going to multi-gig is a necessity if you have a lot of people working. Is it necessary for a big stadium environment? We'll see. But for people that are doing serious work, they can absolutely require it. So the lessons learned for us, we obviously took away a lot as a vendor. Um, we needed an auto RRM, um, which I'm happy to say is now public. We finally launched an auto RRM solution that works. Um, obviously, you want to be able to 
figure that out, be able to pre-plan your channels in a, in a tool like Cydos or Hamina, but it's good to have an auto RRM at least to start. Uh, we finally put our AP name in the beacon frames for easier surveying that's been asked for by literally everyone here. Yep, network 10.1, you're getting the checkbox to turn that on. We also had, when we were setting up channels, we started with 40s. Uh, we wanted to make non-PSCs easier to select. So you have to be careful with allowing users to select non-PSC channels because you could end up in a scenario where uh, users set up a six gig only network, they set non-PSC channels, then they wonder why nothing can connect. So we added a pro installer mode where you can say, yes, I know what I'm doing, and get access to that. We worked a lot on multicast management over the wire. Like I said, we had a lot of multicast stuff going for AV. And finally, a network configuration API for queuing changes. This was a number one request from the customer side. They wanted to be able to track and own who made what changes, who ordered what changes, and be able to schedule them for a defined window. This is just a brief video of our channel AI of just how it looks in the interface if you haven't played with it yet. Um, super quick, just hit the optimize button and then it does its calculations and boom, moves the channels. So I'll just end really quick with some key metrics. 28,000 unique max, 38,700 square meters of Wi-Fi coverage with 150 terabytes of data transferred to WAN and eight gigabits at peak of WAN consumption. So in conclusion, if you're doing a setup like this, really it's the same techniques you guys already use to build out offices, to build out any other building. You just scale them up, you need some more APs, but it's the same sort of survey techniques. Directional antennas overhead are an absolute cheat code for any sort of big open space. If you have any sort of truss structure, roof structure overhead that you can access, it's a great way to do a high density network. Um, remember your relationship between TX power and channel width for six gig. Remember, because of the constant SNR, or the constant SNR balance, when you increase that channel width, you can also increase your max TX power. You want to preserve your airtime as much as possible through your SSID config. And honestly, the most important thing, don't forget about the human and collaborative element. There were so many times that I had to meet with the MSP, meet with the customer, meet with our surveyors to talk about how we can improve not just the event, what were the immediate changes, but how we can make things better going forward. And that's really why we're here at WLPC. That's why I love coming to WLPC is that human collaborative element. And I will leave you guys with that. Thanks. <laughs>